the radio show on Unity Online with uh, Reverend Ogan Holder, and they run Project Sanctus together. So I will leave it at that, Kelly, and turn everything over to you. Thank you for being here. You're very welcome. It, uh, yeah, Innovation Alchemists uh, is one of the labels. You know, people say, well, what do you do? You know, I'm a teacher, I'm an engineer. One of mine is I'm an Innovation Alchemist. And one of the reasons I say that is because it means you're never quite sure what's going to happen in any given moment, which is my favorite, one of my favorite ways of being. I want to back up for a minute to uh, just, again, because I, I tend to stir things a little bit and expand our worldview. And I want to go back to the land acknowledgement that you guys did and, and invite us to take a moment in terms of a land acknowledgement and acknowledge that the technology we're using to be here this morning <clears throat> is a result of mining materials out of earth. Uh, and so the metals and uh, minerals and, and uh, you know, plastics, we use oil, so it had to be drilled from earth. So I like to add on, and you don't have to do this, I just, but in my experience, when I'm doing a land acknowledgement, I also want to acknowledge not just I'm a settler, right, on land where someone before me lived and stewarded the land. And I want to do it in a contemporary way as well, where I acknowledge the land that was, you know, the earth that was used to, to extract materials so that we could do what we're doing today, right here and right now. Um, and I'm not suggesting we stop doing it, keep doing it. I just want to, the more we presence it, the more likely we are to find innovative ways, you know, to, to reduce the, uh, the damage. You know, some people think we've gone too far, we've destroyed Earth and just sort of waiting out their life. Uh, others are much more hopeful and everything in between. That being said, um, yeah, will the real Jesus please stand up? Because it is the you know as as you listen you may hear some connection to um, to what I just said, which is sort of expanding the brain or turning the mind a little inside out or oh I hadn't you know for some people I hadn't thought of that before or didn't you know I didn't know that or because it, it'll it disturbs like it for me it disturbs me makes me uncomfortable it also expands my my vision, it expands how I see the world and how I be in the world, which is meaningful for me and, and does bring me some joy. And in the same breath, I'm like, oh, crap, you know, yes, it's a spiritual word. It's okay. I didn't use a different one. Um, but it's that, oh, there's something else, right, that I can't ignore. And the teachings of Jesus are not really that dissimilar. Um, I remember one, um, and I don't know if just realized, I don't know if you had this TV show in Canada, but it actually was even before my time, but it was a TV show called To Tell the Truth. And uh, it was, yeah, some, some people are nodding their head, they remember it. Uh, but it was, a, it was this game show that, and if you don't know of it and, and never saw it or heard of it, it's okay, I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. But they would have, so there would be this panel of, at the time, kind of famous actors or singers or something. And what the whole point was, is they had, there was three people and standing in front of them. One person was the real, say, Fred Smith. Um, but they had this panel of famous people had to figure out who the real one was. And so, um, so these three people say, pretending to be, I got to pick somebody famous, say, you know, John Bon Jovi, right? The musician, hopefully all of you know that name. Um, you know, that's the thing with intergenerational, <laughs> the cultural context, right? And the cultural uh, points, you have to really like, okay, does everybody know that name? So there's these three people standing there all pretending to be John Bon Jovi. And there's this panel who through a series of questionings, you know, asking each person, um, they get to choose, um, trying to figure out who's the real one, who's the real John Bon Jovi. Um, now, it probably wouldn't use him because most people know his face, but it's someone famous for something. And each of these three people try to convince the panel that they are who they said they are. And remember that all three are claiming to be the same person, but they're obviously not. <clears throat> and then at the end of the show, 
uh, the announcer would say with a whole big, you know, like drum roll and, and, you know, so much, you know, oh, angst, you know, would the real so-and-so please stand up? Uh, and then, you know, and then everybody waits while all three stay seated and then one of them will pop up and then, yeah, you know, and I think there might have been prizes if someone guessed it right. But it, uh, it, it, I always, I always felt the same way about Jesus, that uh, wherever I was, whatever, whether I was five or, you know, 40 sitting in church or synagogue or, you know, um, whatever I was doing, you know, and, and Jesus pops up in the conversation or in the topic or what I'm learning, I always had this sense of, yeah, but what, would the real Jesus please stand up? You know, cause it was very, for me, my experience was pretty, had a lot of cognitive dissonance, right? On one hand, I would hear about, you know, and so as a, a little girl, <clears throat> I had my children's Bible and, you know, lots of colored pictures of the Kevin Costner Jesus, right? Holding the little baby lamb. And I say Kevin Costner because, of course, the nice blonde hair and blue eyes or sandy brown hair and pretty blue eyes uh, holding the little baby lamb and then, you know, other kids around him. And then other times uh, as I got older, I might be in a, a Bible with, you know, an older child's Bible still with pictures. But now that it was Jesus, maybe the hair got a little little more brown. And but now there are all these adult men around him kind of following him. Um, one story would tell me that Jesus wanted me to be good, um, yet he got angry at his own mother. Uh, there's the story of turning the tables over in the temple. Um, you know, I was told I wasn't supposed to smoke or drink, but yet his mother bullied him into turning water into wine. That was his the first miracle that was written down, supposedly attributed to Jesus in the uh, Gospel of John. Um, you know, I was supposed to, you know, hang out with the quote unquote good kids, right, or be in Girl Scouts or band, you know, but but hang out with the good kids. Um, and yet I would read stories of Jesus hanging out with hookers, hanging out with riffraff, hanging out with, uh, you know, beggars and thieves. And um, but I was supposed to choose very carefully um, and be very discerning. He talked back to his elders. Um, and I knew what happened when I did that. And really what I learned was when I would talk back to an elder to run fast, like have one foot poised out the door if you're going to talk back. I don't know that Jesus did that, you know. And honestly, we know very little of what Jesus actually did. But, um, and th but then, you know, you turn around and, and the stories are written that he raised people from the dead, walking on water, you know, healing people of sickness. Uh, and, um, and yet, and yet he couldn't keep them from killing him. Like, really, you couldn't get out of, got on a horse and just dry, ride out of town. You know, like this is the thinking of a child, you know, a teenager, an adult, you know, and the more that I went into academia around Bible scripture, especially Jesus, it didn't get any easier. Um, and then of course there's this, this really wasn't my experience, but then I started to hear more and more um, how uh, um, Jesus died because of me. He died for my sins. Now, if that isn't the ultimate guilt trip, I'm not sure what is. Um, and that doesn't, that just sounds pretty counterintuitive to me or pretty counter to, okay, what happened to the guy that was healing the sick that what happened to those pictures of sitting with the baby lambs and being kind to everybody? Um, and frankly, I, I, some of the, the images were, I, I remember thinking at the time, I, I, I should have known like at the age of eight, you know, you're going to be a theologian. Because I remember think, looking at some of the pictures of like, okay, now you're just being too nice. <laughs> now you're just being a doormat. So I get, I, you know, and we just interpret, right? We interpret what's around us. We interpret what we read. We also have been given stories without the, you know, given the skills to actually be critical, critically thinking, you know, to be a critical thinker, but rather stories of Jesus are handed down and we go, okay, as if it's real, as if it's true. Um, and I'm not saying is or not, it's the assumption that we have, 
right? Of what's, you know, is it real? Here's an old cultural uh, phrase, you know, is it real or is it Memorex? Um, and what gets lost often is that Jesus was Jewish. Jesus was very Jewish. Jesus did not come, let me give you a few things. Jesus did not come to create a new Judaism. He was not trying to dismantle Judaism of his time. He was very Jewish. He followed Torah. He, um, he also did a lot of inquiry, right? He also, sort of like the land acknowledgement, invited people into, hmm, you know, go, oh, wait a minute. Uh, it's what wasn't what I was thinking. Um, you know, and Judaism, core teaching in Judaism associates the love of God with the love of neighbor. Uh, that that is, that is, you know, caring for each other. Judaism is very much, it's not something Jesus had to teach to love your neighbor. It's not something Jesus had to go, you know, do this community collective care thing. It was already then. That's Judaism. Judaism emphasizes the golden rule, right? Found in lots of religious traditions. Um, and so he, that's why he talks to people about reconciliation. That's why so many of the stories are attributed to him about human interaction um, as opposed to Hebrew ritual. He's not saying throwing it out, throwing out ritual, um, but he is talking about how we live and how we act with each other. And, <clears throat> and so I, I wanna unpack a couple of, um, just briefly, a couple of uh, parables because it was the most powerful teaching tool that Jesus used. It's probably one of the reasons that he, you know, is who he is today, um, because he certainly was, um, you know, by scholars' standards, you know, pretty brilliant and very creative in, in the tool he used for teaching. Because the other thing most people don't know is that he wasn't the only one walking around in Galilee doing what he was doing. There were many, many people, you know, moving through time and space at the time of Jesus doing the exact same things, preaching, healing, um, you know, um, teaching, you know, but he's, but Jesus, probably because of the, the way that he taught, meaning using the parables, um, which turn the brain inside out, which, you know, are, um, you know, all moving from conventional wisdom to a little bit more alternative wisdom, um, and not necessarily everybody was doing that. He so uh, it just if and if I'm let me pause here. So if I'm if I'm already like messing with your Jesus, just take a breath. Okay? Just take a deep breath. <clears throat> it's not. I'm not. I love Jesus. Jesus is my guy, but not for reasons that people think. Um, but Jesus is my guy because the focus is on life. The focus is on how we live. And for me, one of the reasons it is that is, be, is a, even if I just look at um, the resurrection, right? We just had Easter last week. And today, for those that may not know, it's the Eastern Orthodox um, um, uh, Easter for Orthodox uh, Christianity, Easter is today. Um, but but I wanted to, so, so I want to go back to the, the resurrection accounts just for a moment because we just had Easter. And one of the reasons, and this is one of the reasons, what I'm about to tell you why Jesus for me is really about what am I doing in this life? But yet we have this entire religion of Christianity developed out of one bad day in the life of this guy. Right. One bad day, meaning, you know, crucifixion and then, of course, resurrection, but an entire religion that are things he actually never said. But is but Paul, the Apostle Paul, who wandered around teaching in the Roman Empire and those after Paul really created what we know today as as Christianity. But if you look at just the resurrection stories um, and if you look at who went to the tomb, you know, if you look at all four Gospels, Mark, Matthew, Luke and John, um, who went to the tomb, each, if you look at the story in each of those four gospels, each of those stories is different. There's one person who's consistent, but the stories are all different. The same thing of 
who was there, who was at the tomb, right? All four stories are different. Who did Jesus show up to at the tomb? All four stories are different. How did they respond? Those that were at the tomb, how did they respond? Each was different. What did Jesus tell them to go do? Each one is different. And, and on and on and on and on. Um, and so for me, when I read that, it's less about, it's fine. Like I, he, these are the words and the actions attributed to Jesus by the writer of the gospel. So whenever we read about Jesus, whenever we read scripture, a couple of things, you have to put on your 2000 year old Hebrew eyes and look at the history, look at the context, look at who's writing and what's their worldview and what's their understanding. So the reason I just mentioned this about resurrection and those differing accounts, for me, it's not about, is this true or not true? Is this factual or not factual? But I see this these stories written differently because they're written by different people with a different mindset, with a different understanding, with a you know different passion about the story. And so I, let me come back to the life because uh, I don't, it's not about a physical re, you know resuscitation, like a resurrection, but what did he do while he was here? And what can I connect to in that, which is why I come back to, okay, well, the real Jesus, please stand up. Because even in this context, there are different, um, you know, each of the four gospels have different, very different stories because the writers are very different. So um, it's important to look at Jesus in his cultural context, um, in his, you know, in the, what's going on at the time that he's, you know, being itinerant. Uh, being free range. That's what I use is free range. When someone asks me what I do, I say, I'm a free range minister. So I think Jesus is kind of free range. Um, and, and we also like to, in unity, we like to say countercultural or radical or unique. And I think we need to bring that down a little bit. Um, yes, there is some countercultural thinking. Um, I don't know how radical, but he, not unique. He, there were many people wandering, doing what he was doing. Um, and so I come back to the, you know, when I say, well, the real Jesus, please stand up. It's really the real Jesus is for me, the Jesus that I construct for my life. But in order to construct a Jesus for my life and, and glean from what the gospel writers say and the words that get attributed to Jesus, I have to go learn. Um, and sometimes this is our, our downfall. I have to go learn what do the scholars say? I have to go learn maybe some from original, you know, as original, you know, Greek um, or Jewish or Hebrew text, you know, that I can um, and just and deconstruct so that I can reconstruct. And what I find is that there's a couple of couple of places where me personally, I find myself very much drawn. And one of them is the parables. And the reason that the parables are so powerful is that in terms of scholarship, there are a few that scholars are convinced he pretty much, you know, this was pretty much Jesus, maybe not exact words, because nobody was walking behind him, you know, taking a verbatim. Uh, but this, this parable is, you know, we believe scholars generally believe was, was real, you know, the teaching of it. So, and I love parables because they, they really point to something that we kind of already know or kind of maybe sitting inside us. And as soon as someone puts words to it, we're like, oh, right. Um, I have that experience at times when I, you know, I'll, be, I'll learn something new and I go, you know, I, I kind of knew that. I just didn't have the words for it. Um, and I think that's what Jesus' parables do. So they're, they're less, to me, they're less about revealing something new and perhaps more about tapping into something unconscious that's really, that's, that's very precious, that's unsettling, um, but it's precious and also our deepest longings. I think it really points to, as a human, the, you know, what we really long for. Um, and at times we've just gotten too busy to really tap into it. So there's three, um, in the gospel of Luke, there's three parables that uh, show up together and they're all lost something's lost there's the lost sheep the lost coin and then the lost son which the lost son is you know is the prodigal son um parables are an art form they're metaphors they're meant to be um they're not statements of the obvious they're meant to sort of uh indict us you know like kind of 
make us a little kind of go, hmm, what, you know, make us uncomfortable. Um, and the idea of the parables is that if you get to the end and you think, um, oh, that's wonderful. Oh, I really, yeah, I really, I, I want to be that way. I want to do that. If that's where our thinking goes, then we didn't get it and we probably weren't listening. And I'm not, it's not an indictment of anyone. It's that the, the, the beauty and the madness of the parable is that the end of it is determined by the listener. Um, and our reaction really should be, that makes me uncomfortable. And this is probably a place I need to go, right? And we've heard that from Myrtle Fillmore, co-founder of Unity on more than one occasion. You know, when we find, you know, the place of discomfort, the place that where the hurt is, the place where the anger is, the place where I don't understand, like, right? All these this places within us that are uncomfortable, therein lies the direction of our healing. And, you know, which is sort of the good news and the bad news. The good news is, well, there's the light shining on, therein lies the direction of my healing. The bad news, and I use the term loosely, is therein lies the direction of my healing. Like there's more, more something else to take care of. And every once in a while, I'm done self-reflecting. And can I not just leave that wound alone? Maybe it'll go away on its own. <laughs> and what I know is that I rest. I pause, I restore, and then I come back. So that's, for me, Jesus' parables are exactly that. They point me to what's uncomfortable. They point me to where um, I'm not aware of. So here's these three parables, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. Um, and they're probably better titled as, they're in Luke chapter 15, in case you're wondering. Um, it, they're probably better titled as the parable of the frantic sheep owner. So that's the one where the, the shepherd has a hundred sheep and one wanders away. Um, and he goes to find the one sheep and bring them home. And then uh, the other one, the parable of the frantic housewife, which is the lost coin, um, uh, cause she loses a coin and, and then goes looking for it. And then the third one, um, you know, is really about a lost son, but it's a father who has two sons, right? So there's, um, which one are we paying attention to? But I don't want to, that one, the, the lost son, I mean, that could be a whole, you know, four week series on the parable of the prodigal son. Um, so I'm not going to unpack that one, but I do want to look at, um, I just want to come back to the, um, the parable of the frantic shepherd, <laughs> the frantic sheep owner. And if I put it in the context of, you know, as I said, we got to put on our 2000 year old Hebrew eyes. Um, if you think about it for a moment, and it's, I'm going to ask a couple questions. And if you don't know, that's fine. But if you, if you put yourself in 2000 years ago at the time of Jesus, and he starts a parable, a story off with about a shepherd that had a hundred sheep and one wanders off. So let's just start there with the shepherd that had a hundred sheep. Like, what do you think that sounds like 2,000 years ago to just someone, you know, in where Jesus is, is preaching and working and being with his disciples? What it sounds like is, wow, th that's a lot of sheep. That's somebody with some money. That's somebody with some resources. It's not an everyday occurrence, right? I'd be lucky if I had a couple of sheep three sheep, but to have a hundred sheep. So the listener, you have to listen like a listener, like how someone would be hearing Jesus because he starts his parables off in a way that the listener at the time would go, oh. So if he's talking about someone, a shepherd who has a hundred sheep, automatically, if I'm listening at the time of Jesus, I'm going to go, oh, like it pauses me like a hundred sheep. Wow. Holy cow. Um, and I'm sort of off into this, like how, who is this person? And, and one wanders off. So then the next question that, that, so 2000 years ago, a question I would have is if I had a hundred sheep, would I notice if one went missing? Think about it. Think about a, a crowd, right? I know a flock of sheep, you know, a uh, hundred sheep. And if one wandered away, would I notice that one had wandered off? Probably not. I might, but, um, and even though <clears throat> I'm tasked with caring for these sheep, it's a lot of sheep. 
it's a, you know, and a lot of money and a lot of resources. And so if one wanders off, if I'm listening, if I'm someone at the time of Jesus, I'm wondering, okay, would I even notice if one wandered off? So then it becomes, it moves more because the story has always been told in the context of, um, you know, to leave the hundred to go find the one that wandered off. Come back to the time of Jesus. Would someone at the time of Jesus leave 100 sheep or 99 sheep not attended to, to go find the one? Probably not. Because you're talking about a lot of money and resources. And so the likelihood of, of the shepherd wandering off is not very likely. So I come back to the parable, I go, okay, so why are you telling me this, right? So this is that thing of if I get to the end, I think I understand it, I probably didn't. Um, and so where, where I go with that one is, okay, I'm probably not going to wander off to go find the one risking losing the other hundred. <clears throat> but now put it, and there's a whole lot more to the parable that, you know, you could unpack if you look at it through a historical and a cultural lens, um, you know, 2000 years ago, but it leads me to today asking myself, who am I even noticing in my world? Right? Who am I noticing in my world? Who am I, do I even notice who's missing? Right? Do I notice who I'm not counting? I don't know about you, but I've gotten off a highway multiple times. I get to the end of the ramp and there's someone there with a little cardboard sign Maybe their grocery or their grocery cart, maybe a little dog, maybe a few people and what looks like all their their precious things in the world that they own. And I don't and I'm not I'm not naive enough to think that I don't know if it's real. I don't know if they're just doing it to get money. I don't care what it does, though, is it it moves me into who who am I not seeing? Who am I not paying attention to? Who am I not counting? Right? Who am I not counting in my world? Who do I unconsciously look over or pass over? Is there people within, you know, if maybe, and I've seen this in, in some church communities, I'm there and maybe there's somebody in, um, in the congregation that's, that might be disruptive, right? Might be, whether it's a child or someone that's neurodivergent, but do I turn kind of, turn it off, like to try to drown it out rather than counting them as part of the, the group that I'm with, right? As part of belonging, right? That's the word that I would use as belonging. So the, the lost sheep is, for me, is much more about who, who am I making sure that I'm seeing, right? He's, who am I? Who am I not seeing? And it requires us to requires me to wake up a little bit and to look a little bit more. Like look around at you know the when you're the next time you're at some kind of community event, look around, see who's there, who's not there. The next time you go into a restaurant, look at your servers, look at the people that are having meals. Who's not being counted? Who's not there? And it's not meant to beat ourselves up. It's not meant to feel guilty about anything. It's just for us to notice what's, who is missing? What life am I not including in my flock, right? All life, all life. I have a, a little story and then I'll, I'll take us to meditation. I have a, um, a few years, it's probably about five years ago, six years ago, I had, I'm a recovering addict uh, in March. I celebrated 34 years clean and I had a, um, I lived in Phoenix for 15 years and for about, thanks, Mark. I had, um, while I lived in Phoenix, I had um, a woman that I sponsored for almost that whole time. And when I moved from Phoenix to come here to Missouri to go to seminary, um, um, slowly our, you know, I wasn't her, her sponsor anymore. And, you know, you move and relationships kind of drift apart a little bit. And then um, she and she called me one day and she was all all worked up uh, 
and, you know, and crying. And I clearly could tell that she had been using because she was so frenetic and so um, just all over the map and crying. And she, she was, she had started using again. And, you know, previously when I knew her, she was clean and, and, you know, knowing her life before as an active addict, I knew it would get ugly and hard very fast. Um, and so she just, uh, you know, I just listened to her and she was in another state and she was kind of running from the law, but she was really deep into addiction. And um, so there would be a phone call periodically, you know, maybe once a month, then every few weeks, couple of weeks. And I just always worked at maintaining, you have a soft place to fall here with Kelly. And then the next thing I know, she's, um, she gets into a, a shootout with police and she shoots a policeman and she gets shot. And now she's in prison for 25 years. Um, and then, and it was just trying to be with her through all that being the soft place to fall, counting, right? Like, and just keeping that idea in mind. And then one day I, um, I'm, I'm, I get to have a phone call with her and she says, she asks me point blank, are you willing to do time with me? Are you willing to do time with me? And I went, ugh, like it just occurred to me that if I'm going to stay in relationship with this woman, if she counts, if I'm going to say that she counts, then yes, I'm going to do time with her to the extent that I work to be in communication and relationship with her, letter writing. Um, but it's not, but that was probably one of the most powerful examples in my life of counting people, like who's counting who am I counting? Who am I, who am I caring for? Because she's in prison. She belongs in prison. You can't shoot a cop and not go to prison. Uh, the, the policeman didn't die. Um, but to be asked, are you willing to do time with me, is saying, are you willing to have me be in your flock, the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? All of it. And I think it's the same question for all of us. You know, when I say, are you willing to do time with me, I don't mean it like imprisoned, but be doing time with each other. So that's one of my, when I ask myself, will the real Jesus please stand up once I've sort of sifted through, you know, the stories that have been handed down that really don't pertain to Jesus. That's one of the places I land is, am I willing to do time with another, especially someone that may be radically different than me? I think that's one of the, which is, a, which is the heart belief of Jewish teaching. And remember, Jesus was Jewish. So let's take, let's take that idea of the counting. Who am I counting? Let's take that into meditation just for a few moments. You can leave your eyes open. You can close them. But in whatever way, take, you, know, you breathe in, you breathe out, following the breath. Just settling the body in whatever way works for you. It's a little bit like calling the parts of yourself home, right? Counting all the parts of you. The physical sensations, the thoughts, the emotions. Just continue to breathe, follow the breath. And as you follow the breath, remember that the activity you can look at, you know, it's two elements, like which is better, inhaling or exhaling? And the answer is yes. And I can equate that to inhaling as I am fully human, exhaling, I am fully divine. You could do it the other way. Inhaling, I'm fully divine. Exhaling, I'm fully human. And we need them both for the wholeness of us. So just keep following your breath. You don't have to slow it down. 
just remember that it is that activity of expressing our full humanity, which is glorious, which is powerful, which is loving. and our full divinity. Which is also powerful and loving. And I am faith and I am will and I am order and I am zeal. And I am divine. Remember, Remembering that my full divinity is expressed and made manifest through my full humanity. And it is never, never about doing any of it perfectly. So as I look around at my world, who am I not counting? Could be a family member, a friend. Could be a group of people, an organization. And when I ask myself, who am I not counting? There is someone, there are people. And it's important to see it and own it because therein lies the direction of my healing. Therein lies the direction of expressing my full divinity through my full humanity. Therein lies my wholeness. So again, and that will be still for a moment and ask yourself, who am I not counting? Just ask your heart, you don't have to Rolodex the brain. Be still for a moment. And when you find the person or people that I'm not counting, or I think don't need to be counted. See yourself placing them into your heart and just hold that image for a moment in the quiet. So come back to your breath, inhale and exhale. So who have I written out or who have I not counted? Let's account for them. And so it is, and so it is, amen.
Thank you, Reverend Kelly. You're always an inspiration to us. And I don't know if you got to see the chat comments that were coming up as your, as your talk was going on, but uh, 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 offering you that you are a soft place to learn, I think is what Bob McGuire said. And, uh, and we so need that because there's so many things that seem so simple, but when we get to actually look into them a little bit and, and say, what do I need to learn? And we take it away. And I, I think that song by Daniel Nema, the I learn and I forget is just so true because we learn and then we forget, but then we learn some more. And thank you for sharing and being vulnerable about your uh, road of recovery. It's uh, really kind of you to be open about that and congratulations on, on 34 years of recovery. That's, that's really awesome. I hope you'll stay around for us and uh, uh, be able to answer some questions or make some more comments. We'd really appreciate that at the end. And. Uh,